because we've got a huge amount of knowledge in our speakers and I know that they can probably talk all night about their particular topics. So we're going to share screens and I'll hand over straight away to Dean Hines from Ecology Links who has more than 20 years, I would say, of experience and knowledge about mountain pygmy possums and we're really, um, really privileged to have you here speaking to us from Tassie tonight. Thanks, Dean. Thank you, uh, Helen. Yes, um, it's actually been more than 30 years, which is a bit frightening. But um, yes, I've been working on mountain pygmy possums for um, quite some time now. Um, I was, thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. OK, so tonight I'll talk about the status and conservation of the mountain pygmy possum. Uh, it's also known as, as Baramus parvus. Uh, the scientific name basically means mouse of the rocks. It was a species first described in the late 1890s, but it wasn't discovered as a living animal until in the 1960s when it was discovered at Mount Hotham. So uh, the picture we've got there is um, a healthy little mountain pygmy possum uh, on the, the sides of Mount Locke, which is near Mount Hotham. Uh, next slide, please. So to give us some idea about where mountain pygmy possums live, we've got three regional populations. Uh, the one furthest to the north is in the Mount Kosciuszko region, extending across the main range and a number of colonies, uh, but also there are some lower elevation populations a bit further north up towards Cabramurra. Sorry, that's hard to get out. In Victoria, we have two regional populations. And if I direct you towards the bottom left-hand corner, we've got a population at Mount Buller. Whoops, if we can just, sorry, go back. Uh, population at Mount Buller, uh, which is, uh, I guess, the smallest in terms of range and habitat. Um, and then we've got a population that extends from Mount Hotham to Mount Bogon which also includes the Bogon High Plains. And in that area, that's where there's a number of, of local populations where the species occurs. Uh, next slide, please. So here's our little darling mountain pygmy possum. They weigh uh, anywhere as an adult from about 30 grams to as much as 85 grams. Uh, basically, they're, they're a hibernating animal. And so what that means is that leading up to winter, and I guess through autumn, they're, they're really striving to put on fat um, in order to go into their hibernation period. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the key food resources for the mountain pygmy possum are bogon moths. Uh, now, I guess bogon moths have been in the media a little bit over the last few years because people may have heard that the numbers that are arriving in the Alpine area are a fraction of what they used to be. Basically, what happens is bogon moths um, spend a lot of their life down in the floodplain lowland areas. And when it comes to the spring period and when the lowland areas are warming up, they start to move and migrate into the cooler alpine areas. And the areas that they like to go to are basically the boulder field areas where the mountain pygmy possums live. Next slide, please. So here's a lovely picture of Mount Feathertop in all its glory. Um, I think I put that slide there just because it is one of our most spectacular mountains. Even though it's quite high, relatively speaking, in Victoria, it doesn't have any boulder field. Uh, so we don't have mountain pygmy possums on Mount Feathertop, but we do have them nearby at Mount Locke and Mount Hotham. Next slide, please. So in terms of what sort of things do mountain pygmy possums eat? Well, obviously the bogon moths I've, I've already mentioned, and they're a really important food resource because when the bogon moths turn up in spring, Basically, that's the time when the mountain pygmy possums are waking up out of their hibernation and are also starting to head towards their breeding period. So that influx of, of um, high fat resource rich bogon moths allows the pygmy possums to put on body condition, but it also allows them to raise their young very rapidly, which is really important 
in an alpine environment because you only have, you know, six to eight months of snow-free times uh, when these animals can operate and feed. So it's important that you get your breeding done very quickly in the summer months. That means that the adults can then put on condition again for hibernation. It also means that the juveniles, the young of the year, can then start to put on condition as part of their preparation for hibernation. In terms of young, mountain pygmy possums, we know can give birth up to 12 young, but um, they are a marsupial, so an animal with a pouch, and they only have four nipples. So basically what that means, and the word for that is supernumerary, it's where you give birth to more young than you can actually raise. So the limit to the number of young they can raise is four. And quite often, on average, they are raising four, but obviously sometimes it can be less, depending on conditions. Um, in terms of other food that they rely on, near these boulder fields, you also get these beautiful little uh, plants called the mountain plum pine, which is one of our native conifers. And they produce these little re red berry-like seed receptors which the pygmy possums like to eat. They taste a bit like watermelon. But the other thing you can see in this photo beside that little red berry is there's a green seed on the end, which is actually the true fruit from the podocarp. And the pygmy possums eat that as well. Now, beside the green seed, there's a couple of little dry seeds. And people may be able to notice that there's one seed that's been cracked neatly in half. Now, that's been done by a mountain pygmy possum. And we know that because mountain pygmy possums have a, a special um, serrated premolar tooth and they can actually saw open these seeds very cleanly and, and get the goodies out. So pygmy possums are omnivorous. They're eating bogon moths. They're eating other insects. They're eating lots of fruit material, seeds and that sort of stuff as well. The important thing about the podocarp and any hard shelled seeds is that mountain pygmy possums are one of the few Australian marsupials that cache food. So um, they're basically a bit like squirrels. They'll collect up these hard shelled seeds and stash them away for presumably over winter when they may run low on their fat reserves, they can then harness that food resource. The other thing I guess I'd uh, actually, next slide. Um, as I was saying before, their, their habitat is the boulder field habitat. Um, this piece of habitat that I'm showing is actually on a ski run at Mount Buller called Federation Ski Run. And that's where one of the main colonies e exists at Mount Buller. So I've done quite a lot of research there. I guess the other point I wanted to say about the mountain pygmy possums is that, yes, they are true hibernators. But what people don't realise about hibernation is that it's not just made up of one big sleep. Hibernation is actually made up of a series of sleeps, which are called torpor or torpor bouts. So if we've got a pygmy possum that's, um, you know, starting to put weight on, it's at the end of autumn, things are starting to get cold. That's when some of the larger pygmy possums start to go in their first bouts of torpor. Um, as the season progresses, these torpor bouts get longer. And the reason why the animals don't just sleep for the full, you know, four, six months is basically because they still need to excrete waste and things like that. Or in some cases, maybe the, the spot where they hibernate or the hibernacular is not suitable. So they need to move somewhere else as part of their hibernation. So mountain pygmy possums are a classic hibernator. We don't have many marsupial hibernators in, in Australia. The other ones that we do have are some of the other pygmy possums, like Eastern pygmy possums. Next slide, please. Now, one of the populations that I've worked on, and I know it is outside the, the Northeast catchment area, um, is at Mount Buller. Now, Mount Buller, we only discovered the mountain pygmy possum there in 1996. And the research that I um, undertook in that area showed that nearly all the key habitats of the pygmy possum were in the ski resort 
and quite a lot of the habitat had already been fragmented by ski runs, roads. There are also issues with uh, high numbers of cats and foxes, etc. Now, if we have a look at the graph um, on the left, uh, I'm really um, showing the numbers of females that we were detecting over the years. And if you go right to the beginning, back in 1996, we were seeing up to 80 female adults, but then the population appears to have dropped really rapidly to a point in 2005 where we were only detecting one or two individuals during our annual monitoring, and that was very scary. What we also found at that time, uh, because as part of the research, we, we mark these animals with small ear tags, but we also take genetic samples um, so that we could know who was mating with who, and I guess who was who. Um, what we found is that yes, demographically, the numbers showed that the population crashed, but genetically the population crashed as well. Now, I guess if people have a look across to the graph on the right, you'll see that the number of males, even back at the beginning, was extremely low. And we think that there was actually a lag in the from the periods leading up to when the species was discovered there, where there was lots of ski resort development, fragmentation and predators, which was actually suppressing the male numbers. And as you can see, the male numbers stayed really low until we started to get towards 2010. In 2010, we were lucky enough to get permission to undertake what's called gene pool mixing, where we, to address the lack of genetic variation. And as part of that, we brought some males in from another regional population at Mount Hotham to mate with the females at Mount Buller. And look, to be honest, at the same time this was all happening, there was a recovery, recovery plan that was put in place addressing many of the other threatening issues such as foxes, cats, habitat destruction, etc. A combination of those things, including the genetic rescue, has actually brought this population back. Um, so there were a number of translocations of males from Mount Hotham and also Mount uh, Tim Spur on the Bogon High Plains. And as part of that, we've got the, I guess, demographic levels up, but also the genetic levels up. And you can see that the male numbers for the last five, six years have remained relatively high. Now, as with everything, it does tend to move around. And last year we did have a bit of dip in numbers and we suspect that it was due to a very poor snow season. But I guess this illustrates the importance with these threatened species of monitoring information. Next slide, please. Uh, ne next slide, please. Um, just a few of the things that have happened in, I guess, the last 20 years. In, in 2003, we had some of the biggest fires we'd seen in the Alpine area. I mean, that's changed a bit now because we've had fires since. But before that, we hadn't had large scale fires in the Alpine area since 1939. And the photo in the top left corner is at Mount Mackay in the Falls Creek Alpine Resort. Basically, the population that lived there relied very heavily on heathland habitats, and a lot of their habitat was lost. And the animal that you can see in the middle was one of the few animals that we caught there, and you can see in the background all the burnt powder carp. Something interesting happened at some of the other populations that were affected by fire. And although it may look a bit grotesque, the photo in the top right hand corner are actually baby pygmy possums that females started to lose um, after the fire. So the females were under stress and then basically turned off their milk and they lost their young for that year. The important thing is though, mountain pygmy possums can live for up to 12 years. So even there, though there was a year or two when they didn't have successful litters, they were able to bounce back in some of the areas because um, they were able to live for so long, survive, and then have successful litters. More recently, however, as I alluded to earlier, we have had issues with bogon moth numbers dropping. Now, the, the white bucket that's in the 
bottom left-hand corner, that's part of a light trap to try and monitor bogon moths. And what we found a couple of years ago is that so few bogon moths turned up that we saw pouch young little losses again, but at even greater level than what we saw after the fires. And that was a real concern. However, what we did notice through the monitoring is that even though recruitment was low, the population still remained relatively high. So it's certainly a concern. And you can argue that this is really, you know, climate change impacting their food source, which in turn impacts the Mount Pygmy fossil. Next slide, please. Other things that have been done it, it, have been around trying to overcome habitat fragmentation, particularly roads like the Great Alpine Road at Mount Hotham and ski runs and those sorts of things. Now, my predecessor in this research space, Ian Manza, was responsible for almost the world's first bio tunnels, I guess, at Mount Hotham. And they were affectionately called the Tunnel of Love. So the picture in the bottom left hand corner, there's my two kids and their cousins. And of course, you know, they're quite loving at the Tunnel of Love, which doesn't often happen with kids that age. Anyway, the reason why it was called the Tunnel of Love is because culverts, which are like shown in the picture where I'm standing there at the bottom, were put under the road and filled with loose rocks. And the pygmy possums were able to move from one side of the um, road to the other. And that's been really important in for mountain pygmy possums because it's reconnected populations. And the picture of the possum at the top is actually one of the first possums that used the tunnel back in 1984. But more recent and in recent years, we've built more tunnels at Mount Little Higginbotham and NECMA has been involved with that as well as other organisations such as the resorts and DELP. Next photo, please, or next slide, please. Look, other issues we've got for the mountain pygmy possums, there's always issues with foxes and cats or feral animals. And one of the slides there shows some of the feral horses. Um, there's another shot there that shows a, a willow on the boulder field. So things like willow control is really important and being undertaken by NECMA and also parks and the resort. But there's all the other issues like there's a wallow there right near a pygmy possum um, habitat. So deer are also an issue where they're browsing on some of the slow growing plants such as the mountain plum pine. I'll also just like to note that, you know, in the top right uh, left hand corner, um, that was a trip I went on with some of the traditional owners trying to find new areas of habitat um, over near Mount Howitt. And the photo there with the helicopter was actually going to Mount Bogon, and that was funded by NECMA um, because that site is particularly hard to get to and there often isn't money around to monitor some of these more remote areas. Uh, next slide, please. And look, I'm just going to finish on on, on this slide. Um, in the top left-hand corner, there are my kids when they were much smaller. Um, we were on top of Mount Higginbotham there, and they'd heard me talk about how they were high, uh, the pygmy possums hibernating under the snow, and they thought they'd give it a crack and see if they could find one, which is always amusing. The other photo of me in the snowshoes is when we actually translocated animals to Mount Buller as part of the genetic rescue. And the other photos are, I guess, some happy field snaps of us working in the boulder fields uh, at Mount Buller and elsewhere. And I've probably gone over time, but um, that's my lot. Thank you very much, Dean. I love uh, a slideshow full of photos. Um, <laughs> it's fantastic because uh, a picture paints a thousand words and just seeing that habitat and that landscape is uh, yeah, very special. Um, so we have some moments. We do have some time for some questions and answers. Um, I'm just looking at the chat. We have one question in the chat, which I'll read out. Um, What's the mountain pygmy possum's anticipated response to predicted low or snow cover in the not too distant future, particularly when they need to compete with other species better adapted to the drier environment? Yeah, it's an interesting question. And I guess one of the concerns we've had for a long time is that mountain pygmy possums 
are believed to have a competitive advantage over a lot of the other more common species like bush rats and antikinus. So that's been the concern under climate change. The only problem is like um, once snow starts to be stripped of these boulder field areas, it's also a very hostile environment for these other species as well. So it is an interesting question. And I guess that's why as part of our monitoring, we actually, um, we actually tag and release all the bycatch. So like bush rats, Antikinus, because we're trying to track their numbers so that as part of the modelling we do, we can look at whether, you know, bush rat influencing pygmy possum numbers. So far, and I mean, I guess I've only been working on them for a very short period. I, I haven't, and that's only 30 years, I guess, but we haven't really picked up any areas where bush rats and these competing animals have really started to push pygmy possums out. But, you know, it's always a concern if you have years where there may be low snow and if the response for pygmy possums is that their survival rate is low because if we start to have consecutive years like that and if we have issues such as low bogue or moth numbers, well, that's when we could see some populations really struggle. At the moment, some of the populations, I guess, that have... Um, have, have hurt most over the years have really been the ones in ski resorts where there's been heavy levels of habitat fragmentation, which has led to things such as predation. So at the moment, it's really about management, trying to look at some of these threatening processes that we do have control over. And at somewhere like Mount Buller, yes, we can't control everything. We can't control the snow. But what we can control is trying to overcome the habitat fragmentation and also create more potential habitat, food producing plants, et cetera, to try and make these populations more resilient. Thanks. Thanks very much for that, Dean. I've got another question for you in the chat. And yeah, if anyone else wants to uh, verbally put one in, put your hand up, please. But how important do you think, uh, based on your experience to date, are bogon moths to the persistence of mountain pygmy possums into the future? Look, and once again, that's a very good question. Um, mountain pygmy possums as a species in the past, you know, going back, five, 10,000 years ago were far more widespread in the Australian landscape. So they have been pushed for whatever reason up into the Alpine area. So look, you would predict that if we lost bogon moth, that mountain pygmy possums would really struggle um, just because their whole life is really based around bogon moths and boulder fields. Even though they eat lots of other things, it, it is truly a key resource. Saying that, um, there are some populations that are heavily reliant on bogon moths. You know, maybe in spring, 80% of their diet might be bogon moths, whereas other areas, it's not like that at all. So bogon moths may only be 20 or 30%. So there is a bit of room to move, I guess you could, could argue, but in some ways, it does depend what other resources are around these boulder fields in terms of heath, food producing plants, and also all the other insects and invertebrates that they might eat. And the questions get harder, Dean. Good. <laughs> um, what can one of us do to help with conservation of the mountain pygmy possum? So us, you know, I live in Albury, what can I do? <laughs> what can you do? <laughs> Well, it's a good question. It truly is getting harder now. <laughs> look, I look. I'm a really big advocate for really trying to heal the land where mountain pygmy possums live. So, I mean, if there was ever a fund to put money towards revegetation, uh, rehabilitation, I think that would be a, a well worthwhile um, pursuit. Um, you know, we would truly love to do some 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 comprehensive research on bogon moths as well. Um, it is a, you know, it would be great to have lots of money to do that. Unfortunately, we just haven't probably got the funds that we need to really look at this at the level that it needs to be looked at. 
Thanks, Dean. And I think we've got time for the one last question and then I'm going to hand on to some of our staff to talk to projects. But are there any ex situ programs running alongside the ones that we do in situ? Yeah, so um, as well as what's going on out there, in the past there have been programs targeting um, captive management and there is a captive management program at, at the moment. Unfortunately, they they have not always been successful. And um, as part of the genetic rescue project at Mount Buller, initially before we decided to go down the lines of using wild to wild translocations, we were trying to use captive management to build up numbers of possums that could be released on Mount Buller. But unfortunately, the breeding success of the animals in captivity were not high enough to allow us to do that. So, look, there there is some work going on um, ex situ, but to this point, it's had very little positive influence on the population simply because the breeding has not been sufficient. And one of the problems we've got now is that once we have animals in captivity for long periods, they are more adjusted to living in captivity and I, I guess are selected for captivity and therefore that can present issues when releasing animals into the wild. Great. Thank Thanks, you. Helen. Thanks, Helen. Thank Thanks, Dean. You. We're almost, we're on time. So uh, well done, team. Um, I haven't heard any other questions, um, but we've got a couple of speakers now and um, we've got Phil Felk and Marina Marua from Northeast CMA or um, Dean used the word NECMA before. So those who aren't in with acronyms, NECMA is Northeast CMA, Catchment Management Authority. Um, so Phil and Marina are going to give an overview of some of the programs that we've got running to help with this, this work, the recovery work. And again, we need to acknowledge the funding through the National Land Care Program and the Australian Government for um, our ability to work with partners in these programs. So I'll hand on first of all to Phil. Thanks, Phil. Well, thanks everyone. Um, great to be here. I'm Phil Falk and I'm the Biodiversity Project Officer in the Biodiversity Team. Um, I work on a number of projects focused around biodiversity and threatened species. Um, this includes trying to help the region honey eater and swift parrot as part of the Bush for Birds project, um, the mountain pygmy possum um, recovery project, um, and the alpine peatland bogs I work on as part of the alpine peatland protection project. Tonight, though, um, I'm going to talk about the mountain pygmy possum recovery project, which um, Dean Hines's work actually ties in with, and Dean's been talking about that. Uh, for this webinar, we sort of wanted to focus on the threatened species aspect, so our keynote speakers are delivering the bulk of the content, but we thought it would be important to give you an idea about how the actual work by, by these incredible people like Dean is actually funded. So, um, the Mountain Pygmy Possum Project, uh, the Mountain Pygmy Possum Recovery Project, more correctly, it's a federally funded project. And it's federally funded because the possum is listed nationally as a, as, as a critically endangered species. And when something is listed as a critically endangered species, some, but not all species, have national recovery plans written up and attached to them. And these recovery plans outline the threats and strategic actions, more or less just summarised by Dean, that we need to take to avoid extinction. And once these recovery plans are written up, it becomes much easier for the government to um, allocate funding because they can be confident that there's a strong roadmap to achieve the protection of these species. Can you go to the next slide, please, Di? Um, and that's what's happened with the mountain pygmy possum. The federal government has provided us, North East CMA, with $1.6 million in funding over the next, well, over five years um, through the National Land Care Project. National Land Care Program, I should say, and we're now in year four, um, to deliver those identified actions from the National Recovery Plan. So we work hand in hand with a number of different partners to deliver um, actions and on ground works, and these include um, annual population monitoring of the pygmy possum by Dean Hines, as just illustrated. And this forms the basis of how we gauge the success of our on ground works program. And it provides 
valuable data to external researchers and government agencies such as Parks Victoria and the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning, which contributes to the bold, you know, the body of knowledge on the possum and it keeps all the possum experts informed on the trajectory of the possum's population. So is it is it going up or down or we do, do we need to look at further actions to conserve it? So this project achieves much more than just on ground actions. Um, the activities also include working with Parks Victoria and the Alpine Resort Management Boards at Falls Creek and Mount Hotham. Um, the works include the reduction of predation, so foxes and cats eating possums, and, and um, works also include reduction of habitat fragmentation and halting further degradation of habitats. Next slide, please. So detail of this work, um, that includes weed control in and around possum habitat. Um, like Dean said, we have to put back, in some places we have to put back the mountain plum pines um, and in other places we have to put um, willows. So we do a lot of willow control. Um, so it's about restoring habitat. Um, control of pest animal species through trapping and baiting of foxes and feral cats. Um, improving sedimentation control along roadsides in the resorts. So one of the major impacts of the resorts and development through those places has been the building of roads straight through the middle of possum habitats. And over the last hundred years, those roads have had dirty shoulders that have become frequently more used by visitors up there. Um, and I'm sure we can all, those of us have been and used the resorts up there in the winter time, can attest to the amount of slush and rubbish that gets deposited along these roadsides. And in places where these intersect with the possum habitats, that, that sediment is running straight into um, mountain pygmy possum habitat. And that's happened at um, Little Mount Higginbotham. And you can see there um, on the right hand side with, with the photo that, that we've, we've completed some road sealing works there and put in a large um, box drain, which now catches any sediment runoff before it can hit the, um, into the mountain pygmy possum habitat. So we've been involved with doing a lot of that sort of thing. Um, Revegetation re works, as I just said, using species of existing possum habitat where we think it can be improved, such as at Mount McKay. Um, at Mount McKay, where Dean showed us a slide earlier that was heavily burnt, we've planted out about two, two hectares of mountain plum pines, and that's starting to yield some slight results. We're moving towards some improvement there. We also opportunistically work with other funding sources that we can connect to the project. And last year we obtained some funding under the Australian Heritage Grant to collect possum scat samples. And we had these genetically tested to find out what the possums were eating so we could better understand how reliant the possum is on the bogong moth and other food species that are found within their, their habitats. Um, and that work goes directly to Dean to, to inform him and also other research bodies that are working on the possum and, and they can use that to um, improve the understanding of their work. Um, next slide, please, Di. Uh, okay. Um, we also work with traditional owners in helping them to reconnect with their possums and the bogong moth and how they wish to be involved with the project. So quite a bit of what we do is working with um, traditional owners and helping them to reconnect with their country in ways that they deem appropriate. And we have quite a, a large body of funding within the project that the Australian government has for us to target towards helping traditional owners in um, connecting with the possum and the bogong moth. Uh, so the project area here, um, it's, it basically follows the same pattern as the as um, Dean's work um, for the habitats around the Mount Pygmy Possum. Um, we're just constrained to the north northeast region. We obviously don't take in the Mount the Mount Buller areas or the um, the Mount Kosciuszko areas. So just this central northeast Victoria area. Um, our major areas include Mount Lock North and East, um, sort of over towards Mount Hotham, Mount Higginbotham West at Hotham Heights, um, Tim Spur, Basalt Hilton, Hill and Heathy Spur, um, sort of uh, sort of getting out towards the middle of that purple area, Bundara and Basalt Temple on the edge of the um, of the Bogong High Plains, the Yetmatangs and Pretty Valley, and then going all the way up to the north at the on the Mount Bogong populations. So um, 
yeah, quite quite an extensive area and quite a few different habitats. Various other locations have been identified for habitat improvements, and we look forward to working with the Australian government and all of our partners towards um, sort of working on these additional sites in the future. Um, and if you want to look, if you want to find out more about our project, we have a great website, um, www.necma. It's down the bottom left-hand corner of the slide. Um, we've got a number of videos that we've recently made, these really great videos, um, and we've put out some fact sheets about the species we work with, not just the mountain pygmy possum, but the region honey eater. So I'd encourage you to go onto our website and please have a look. Um, that'd be great. And I'm going to now hand over to Marina Marua, who's our other project officer working with the possum as part of the bushfire recovery project, and she'll also give you a quick rundown. Marina. Thank you so much, Phil, and hello, everyone. Uh, as Phil say, I am Marina. I'm also a project officer here at NECMA, and I'm going to very briefly introduce you to our new bushfire recovery project. Uh, this project is started this year, and it is a follow-up of previous projects that provided immediate response after the bushfires. Uh, so since the, the bushfires in 2019, we have been ongoing projects uh, trying to help the species. Next slide, please, Di. So, what are the projects? The project is funded through the Bushfire Recovery for Species and Landscape Program and has two main components. The first component is around weed and pest control on alpine peatlands and also habitat for other threatened species. And the second component is the one focused on the mountain pygmy possum. Um, the Bushfire Recovery Project will add to the mountain pygmy possum recovery project again in two different ways. One, by supporting a new genetic population analysis in partnership with CESA Australia. And this new assessment, new genetic assessment will help us understand the current condition of populations of pygmy possum, not only in the Northeast, but around across the whole area in Victoria and the future management actions for the species. And the second way that we're going to add to the recovery of the species uh, is by restoring mountain pygmy possum habitat. And that's going to happen in partnership with Mount Hawthorne Alpine Resort. Next slide, please, Die. So if we look back to Phil's map uh, and we zoom into Mount Hawthorne, we'll see part of the core habitat for mountain pygmy possum that is highlighted in red and yellow. And in black, you can see the Mount Little Higgy Old Quarry. That's the area that we're going to restore through, again, intensifying weed control, placement of additional boulders, and that means literally bringing more rocks and habitat for mountain pig possum, and then following that up with vegetation, again, with key species, um, key species for the mountain pig possum, so such as the, the, the plum, that Dean uh, talked about earlier. So our aim of this project is basically to extend and improve habitat for mental pygmy possums and just add to the amazing work that's already been done. Uh, the activities haven't started already. Uh, they're gonna start at the end of this year. So you stay tuned and you're gonna hear more about that in the future. And I think that is it for me. The next slide, please, Di. And then just again, quick acknowledgement um, to the Australian government, just to say that the Mountain Pygmy Possum Recovery Project and the Regional Bushfire Recovery Project are supported by NECMA and our amazing delivery partners through funding from the Australian government. And thank you so much. Back to you, Helen. Thanks very much, Marina. Thank you. And. Um... The next person we've got to speak is another key partner, and it's Monica Herzberg from Parks Victoria is going to give a bit of a bit of an overview because Parks Victoria are the land manager for much of this habitat. So thanks, Monica. I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Helen. Um, I was expecting you guys to have my presentation. Is that um, I, I believe we happening? do. Oh, and, and, and I think Di will share that with you. I, I won't panic yet, then. Just in a moment. <laughs> yep. Um, thanks, Di. 
nearly there. I think the internet's gone slow today. It all got shook up this morning. I was actually just thinking it was incredible that it was working so well. We had so many people online without, you know, fiber optics being broken or something. Not that I know that much about how internet works, but anyway, here we are. Um, yes, so as Marina just said, this uh, the Parks Victoria component of the Mount Pimmy Possum Protection Program at the moment is uh, being conducted in association with the North East CMA and with funding from the Australian government. Um, and this is just a little slide to acknowledge that. Uh, next slide, please, Di. I, I would like to say that um, all these photos that I've got today are courtesy of Johanna Orich, who is a ranger out of the Mount Beauty office here in Northeast Victoria. I think she took all of them herself, um, but I'm not 100% certain, but Credit to her for letting me share them anyway. So we've heard lots about the Pimmy Possum. I don't have to say anything about it, but it was a really cute photo, so I just wanted to put it there. And we've also heard, next next slide please, Di, heard about the um, environment in which they're living in. And so what we're doing at Parks Victoria is trying to make this environment more resilient by conducting um, predator control programs and uh, weed control programs in an attempt to make the uh, boulder fields as um, favourable for allowing population growth for the pygmy possums. Um, and hopefully Dean is proud of our efforts. Next slide, please. How we're doing this is um, through uh, camera monitoring, um, which it's, we're yet to really determine if we're doing this successfully, but we are trying very hard to collect some um, data about our efforts, about our fox control programs and our um, general uh, predators around the, the um, pingy possum boulder fields in an attempt to, to tailor our management to make it a bit better. And um, we have only been monitoring the sites and our activity locations for three years now. And uh, we have been changing some of the stuff that we do based on what we're seeing, but we're not actually collecting uh, at this stage, we're not actually collecting so, um, data in any sort of scientific way that allows us to definitely confirm or deny if we're having um, a meaningful impact, but we are collecting information and using that to determine where we put baits and things like that. And I've realised I've just started talking to the wrong slide, but that's okay. So this is a camera. Here we are putting in a camera. Um, this is one of the other rangers that actually works at Mount Buffalo, Matt Irvine, but he's uh, helping out on the Bogan High Plains today. Um, th and these cameras either go on stakes or on trees and are motion sensitive and they take imaging, imagery throughout um, day and night. Next slide, please, Di. Um, the next part of the program is fox baiting, which we've um, been doing across the Bogong High Plains since the 2003 fires in an attempt to protect um, or to reduce the amount of predation on the pygmy possums. And uh, a fox bait um, gets put in this little um, dirt bath or sand bath just below the surface and is um, dug up by a fox passing by. Um, and either eaten, which is the hope, or just cached um, for later to have a snack if they get really hungry. This is Yo, the lady who took all the photos. Uh, next slide, please, Di. The next part of the program is willow control. And uh, if you can, if your eyes are keen, you can see where the um, boulder fields uh, halfway through that photo have some yellowy um, shrubs in them rather than these sort of green shrubs that you can see in the foreground and they're, um, they're grey sallow willows and they're the ones that we are trying to kill in an attempt, not trying, we are killing, in an attempt to um, remove the competition for uh, favourable species for the pygmy possum such as the um, alpine plum pine that Dean was talking to us about. Next slide please Di. Um, so here we are with my cat image and my kangaroo image and I was going to tell you all about how we were using the data but I already did that so just appreciate the photos and apologies I didn't put a photo in there from um, night time but the photos are the uh, cameras are surprisingly um, impressive at night time I think they show very accurately what comes past and we get um, 
uh, foxes, cats, wallabies, birds, deer, um, people, if they walk past. It's um, all very interesting data. Next slide, please, Di. This, these two maps are about the, um, the fox control, where they are located throughout the landscape. Um, there's a lot going on in them, and I'm sorry if they're a bit overwhelming because it's so small, but if you can make out the gold and yellow patches at the north of the map, that's Mount Bogong, where um, those golden patches are the boulder fields, and throughout the maps moving south, they um, come into Falls Creek and then go down to Hotham, and you can see, yes, brilliant, thank you, you can see where the ping possums are living. The green dots on that map are the cameras, and all the, all the um, red information on that are where fox bait baits were back in um back in no no they were that's the core fox baiting site sorry and then the national land care funding that we've um implemented over this five years funding stream has allowed us to extend the funding that's what we were doing for many years but we've now extended the program to what's on the right and the blue around all the dots are um is like the area that we believe under from understanding fox um range that we are servicing from the baiting and the different colors just show where we're using uh vehicle access atv access or walking access to um put in those baits the baits are either fresh liver baits or um, a shelf stable variety the fresh liver can stay in the landscape for a week the shelf stable stays in the landscape for um uh three weeks and there's usually enough funding to um get about 10 runs in a season and uh, we focus a lot of that energy on the shoulder periods of um, summer sorry spring and autumn because that's when the foxes within the landscape are more um, keen to find some free food next slide please die this is just one of the areas we're treating with willow it's the uh, what are you saying here Dean oh, I missed it sorry um, I'll, I'll read it in a second. This is Mount Lock. Um, it's just a, a map from two years ago, or three years ago when we were doing some willow control and just um, just wanted to show sort of the effort that goes in to killing willows across the boulder fields. So the yellow outline there is the boulder fields. The green are the track logs from the contractors. You can see where they've walked backwards and forwards and around and around. And then the red dots are the willows that they've um, treated and uh, removed from the landscape. We have since um, retreated Mount Lock and we'll visit it again this year just to ensure that we're um, securing, not securing, um, investing in that legacy to make sure that the funding is um, achieving a willow free or a much reduced willow environment for the pygmy possums. Next slide, please, Di, and it is the last one. And there's a little tiny possum there in the belly of the um, mum possum. And I'll just have a look at what Dean said to see if I can share it with everybody. Oh, Helen saying something. Uh, thank, thanks so much, Monica. There was a question from Barbara too, just about um, the, obviously the National Parks Fallen uh, VNPA, volunteer program on grey willows is uh, and I said yes. you'd answer that in the chat but you might be oh. able to quickly answer that oh yes that's um that happened with in association with northeast CMA money as well but that occurred for five years it was um under the previous funding stream and it it targeted grey sallow willows but was focusing um on alpine peatlands as the asset for protection rather than the boulder fields just because of yeah. the way the funding worked but it any willow dead is a good willow really so um I, i'm pretty happy that they were there to help sorry i stopped reading what dean said have you got what dean's but, one yeah um dean has said in recent years uh the willow control contractors have been doing a thorough job we really need to keep this going and so just from northeast cma's perspective I, I put into the chat that we are supporting through our peatland project and the australian government funding willow control and we are actually i think it's really important as everyone said willows don't go away quickly and we need to be on to them and be vigilant and i think everyone saw how remote the landscape is so remote invasive weed control is not cheap it takes labor people on foot or in aerial mobi mobiles um, to control so 
Um, yeah, so good questions. Monica, you might like to put another answer in the chat, but thank you very much, Monica, for your time. I think you're, you'd finished that beautiful photos. Thanks, Yo, for those photos.